اگر آپ کو ہمارا چینل پسند ہے تو سبسکرائب بٹن پر پریس کیجیے اور بیل آئیکون پر کلک کر کے ہمارے آنے والے ویڈیو سے اپڈیٹ رہیے اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم شروع کرتا ہو اللہ کے نام سے جو بڑا مہربان نہایت رحم والا ہے قل هو اللہ احد اے رسول آپ ان لوگوں سے کہہ دیجئے کہ اللہ ایک ہے اللہ الصمد اللہ ایسا بے نیاز ہے کہ وہ کسی کا موتاج نہیں اور اس کے سب موتاج ہے لن يلد ولن يولد ولن يكن له كفوا احد اس کی اولاد نہیں اور نہ وہ کسی کی اولاد ہے اور نہ کوئی اس کے برابر کا ہے آپ سب لوگوں کو دل سے گزارش ہے کہ اگر آپ نے اب تک ہمارے چینل کو سبسکرائب نہیں کیا ہے تو اس چینل کو ضرور سبسکرائب کر لیجئے اگر آپ کو یہ ویڈیو پسند آیا ہو تو اس ویڈیو کو لائک ضرور کیجئے اگر آپ اس ویڈیو کو دوسروں تک پہنچا کر نیکی کمانا چاہتے ہیں تو اسے شیئر ضرور کیجئے See, we must understand this. Though nobody wants to spell it out, nobody wants to say it, it is written not in one, in many religious books across the world, it is written clearly, those who are not like you deserve to be killed. Let's come to the point. I know, this may bring things upon myself, but it's okay. Not in any one book, in many books it is written clearly. Those who do not believe the same things that I believe must die, they are fit to die, they are unfit to live here. This is clearly there. So because people are claiming it is the word of God, they don't have the courage to amend the book. It is time that you take sensible part of people who believe in these books and say, see, if you edit these ten pages, your book will become wonderful. The Quran says, فَإِذَنْ سَلَخَ الْأَشْرُ الْحُرُمْ فَاقْتُلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ هَيْسُ وَجَدْتُمُوهُمْ وَخُزُوهُمْ وَحْسُرُوهُمْ وَقْعُدُوا لَهُمْ كُلَّ مَرْسَدْ فَإِن تَابُوا وَأَقَعَمُوا السَّلَاةِ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةِ فَخَلُّوا سَبِيلَهُمْ Slay the idolaters wherever you find them, seize them, surround them and everywhere lie in ambush for them. But if they repent from their wrong beliefs and establish regular prayers and pay zakah, then spare their lives. Now as far as the verses which are related to the people of the book are concerned, they are also found in Surah Tawbah and they read, قَاتِلُوا الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَلَا بِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَلَا يُحَرِّمُونَ مَا حَرَّمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَلَا يَدِينُونَ دِينَ الْحَقِّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ حَتَّى يُؤْتُوا الْجِزْيَ عَنْ يَدٍ وَهُمْ صَاغِرُونَ Fight those who believe not in Allah or the last day, nor hold that forbidden which has been forbidden by Allah and His Messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from amongst the people of the book until they pay the jizya after being subdued and live a life of submission. So on the basis of these verses, it is construed that Muslims must wage war against all types of disbelievers and then either they must subject them to accept faith, uh, the idolaters among them have to accept faith, otherwise they will be put to death. And the people of the book, if they, are, they do not want to accept faith, then they shall pay jizya and remain subservient to the Muslims. Now these verses actually are found and the subject to discuss is found at numerous places in the Quran. And in order to understand what they actually convey, one must realize that there is a specific law of the Almighty which relates to the messengers of God and which is operational only and only in the times of the messengers of God. Punishments of God, you know like the flood of Noah? The flood of Noah? Or you know earthquake or fire from the sky? Or the town sinking into the ground? Those kinds of punishments come from God, you know when they come? When a messenger is in the flesh with the people and he's rejected. 
then God's wrath comes. When a messenger is not there, those kinds of unique punishments don't come on the people where they're annihilated. It's only at the, just at the final rejection of a messenger. And by the way, let me add something else. When the flood water, water reaches up to here, up to here, in the case of Noah, right? The only thing about water is the nose now. Does God hit the pause button and say, you learned your lesson now? Let me take the water back down. You watch it this time. Does that happen? There's a fire rain from the sky, and right before it hits the guy on the top of the head, it's done. <laughs> you would joke about the, you would joke about God's wrath now? You think it's funny now? Does it ever happen? Once it starts, you can't stop. This is a this is God's tradition in previous nations. This is true of Islamic tradition and the same stories that are mentioned in the Bible. This is what we believe. Now, in the prophet's case, the punishment was not coming from the sky, or a rain, or flood, or a typhoon, it was the Muslim army that took over the city of Mecca. And the God's tradition fulfilled all criminals who fought against the messenger should be what? Killed. Killed. But the pause button is pressed until four months. The pause button was never pressed before. It's four months. Think about it. If you want to leave, move to Rome. Go ahead. Move somewhere else. Go ahead. Otherwise, you will face God's wrath which has been coming from previous prophets too. And this is the messenger, and God does not forgive those who violate his messenger's causes. Those who have been ardent criminals. It's up to you. The point being that this verse cannot be taken as a carte blanche uh, ex uh, execution order on all non-Muslims. And one simple historical fact, that not a single person lost his or her life because of this verse. This verse is a threat. You have four months or else you're gone. It's a threat and it was meant to be a threat that scared the people and that is why paganism disappeared from Arabia, which was exactly what Islam wanted. So to take this verse, kill the pagans wherever you find them, that's what they always do. Or they say kill the infidels wherever you find them and to ignore the entire context that in the same verse, or actually in the next verse, verse number six, Allah is saying, that if any mushrik seeks your protection, then grant him protection until you explain to him Islam and take him to a safe place, then after that he is on his own, you're on your own. So verse number six clearly says, Anybody wants protection, give him protection, explain to him Islam, accompany him to the borders, get rid of him, and then you go your way, he goes his way. Not one person was actually killed or executed as a result of this verse. It was meant to threaten the pagans. Either accept and stay where you are, or pack your bags, get rid of your businesses, sell your stuff, and go live elsewhere. And that's exactly what happened. Remember, these verses are not instructions for me and you today. They are records of history that are mentioned in the Quran, whereby we can learn examples from. So you find some non-Muslims pick up the Quran and they say this Quran preaches terrorism. No, the Quran is the furthest away from terrorism, but they have not understood the Quran. The Quran has verses of history where history is recorded. They translate it as though those are commands for me and you. Nay, they are not commands. So we must not fall in the trap. We need to know these verses are connected to issues that occurred in history. We need to learn from them. Just like the other books of history where other wars which were fought by the non-Muslims are recorded in those particular books. No one says that the British are barbaric or the Americans are barbaric. When books of history record what they have done in the past, but rather we learn from what they have done. They also learn from what they have done. The same applies. The Quran has three items in it. It has news about those before us. It has items of history in it. And it has news and prophecies of what is going to come in the future. And it has It has laws and regulations governing how we shall lead our own lives and judging between us. Those are the three types of verses in the Quran. So the verses we have read today, they applied at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they definitely serve as a lesson for all of us.
Let us now uh, go over uh, the very first verses of Tawbah. Bara'atu min Allahi wa rasulihi ila alladhin ahadtu min al-mushrikeen. Bara'atu min Allahi wa rasulihi. This is a declaration of dissociation. It's a very powerful beginning. It's a very powerful beginning. Bara'atu min Allahi wa rasulihi. That this is a declaration of cutting off all ties. Dissociation. There is no powerful word in English like bara'a in Arabic. That literally cutting off all ties. From Allah and His Messenger. To all those who we have some treaties with from the pagans. So there were treaties in the 6th year, 7th year, 8th year, all of these treaties. Now this is the declaration that all of those treaties are going to be made null and void. Now anytime you have a treaty with somebody, before you break it off, you have to tell them. You cannot surprise break it off. It's against Islam, it's against etiquette. This is what Allah is revealing this surah for. That any treaty we have, we are now going to break it off. And Allah then gives the conditions and the, uh, and the uh, details of that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَسِيحُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرٍ So go ahead and wander around for four months. Do what you want for four months. So all treaties are going to come to an end in four months. You have four months and you are completely safe and free for four months. Not just in your lands, because the treaties were specific to the Banu this, the Banu that. Now Allah is saying, I am making the treaty broader in terms of geography. For four months, you are free to go anywhere. Anywhere and do whatever you want. And Allah Azza wa Jal is not giving this to you because He is weak. This is not because Allah is incapacitated. No, this is a generous gift to you. And Allah Azza wa Jal will humiliate the uh, pagans. And this shall be a declaration. Adhan. This is a declaration from Allah and His Messenger to all of mankind on the day of the big Hajj. Al Hajj al Akbar. And this is the day of sacrifice. Yom al Nahr. Which is the day after Arafah. This is Al Hajj al Akbar. This is the day after Arafah. That Allah and His Messenger have cut off all relationship from the Mushrikeen, from the pagans. There is no more relationship with the uh, pagans. So if you repent, it is good for you. And if you turn away, then know that you are not going to defeat Allah. And that uh, give glad tidings to those who reject uh, that they shall have a severe uh, punishment. Except, there is an exception here. Except, meaning the four months, those whom you have a specific treaty with the pagans, with the time clause. Now the four months is those you don't have a time clause with. If you have a specific treaty with the pagans, any tribe, and they have not broken their promise at all, then in that case Allah says, فَأَتِمُّ إِلَيْهِمْ عَهْدَهُمْ إِلَى مُدَّتِهِمْ Go ahead and fulfill their contract or treaty until you put that time clause in goes away. And that is because there were some small tribes, the Prophet actually put a time clause for one year, for this many months, he put a time clause. So we are a fair nation and people. And if the time clause was at the beginning of the treaty, and they didn't break anything of the treaty, then you don't have the right to break the treaty. You understand the difference between an unconditional treaty and a conditional treaty. So Allah puts the exception here. The conditional treaty that had a time clause, and they were good to you, and they honored the treaty, then how about them? Then فَأَتِمُّ إِلَيْهِمْ عَهْدًا إِلَى مُدَّتِهِمْ Go ahead and fulfill their treaty until their time clause finishes. So be fair to those who are fair to you. Then the fifth verse comes and I have to go into a little bit of detail because this is the most misinterpreted verse from Islamophobes. This is the verse that is always used by Fox News and by Spencer and Pamela Geller and all of these people. This is that verse. It is called the verse of the sword. Ayatu as safe. The verse of the sword. And you have to understand this verse in the context of the ninth year of the Hijrah. In the conquest, con after the conquest of Mecca, paganism is being eliminated. All of this needs to be understood. That Allah says, when the sacred months finish. Now, what are the sacred months? Some scholars said the sacred months are the famous sacred months of the Hijri calendar. Others said, Allah called the four months in verse number two. He called them the sacred months because those are the four months you cannot fight for this particular year. 
Meaning for this year, those four months have become sacred because you cannot fight. So basically when those four months finish, so when the sacred months, those four months finish, then what? Then you have an open license to attack and kill and uh, surprise them and whatever. Now, now, no, see here's the point here. Here's the point. This verse was revealed for the Haram and for the Arabian Peninsula. That there's not going to be paganism, idol worship in that sacred land anymore. You cannot worship an idol in the lands of the Haram. And so they were given four months. You have two options. Get rid of your paganism and accept Islam. And that's exactly what Allah says uh, in this very verse that the, is the verse of the sword that Allah says, but if they repent and they start praying and giving zakah, then they are your brethren. Allow them to be what they want to be. So in the same verse of the sword, after they've been told you have four months, you can either pack your bags and get out or face war. Now the Almighty Himself has taken upon Himself to punish people through these messengers, through His messengers which He, sends, he has sent in, in the past, uh, people who deny, deliberately deny the truth, so that this whole exercise can be made a substantiation for the fact that a day of judgment will also come for all other people. So in order to make the day of judgment a corroboration, a fact of, of reality, this whole exercise was conducted by the Almighty through his various messengers, various messengers who he elevated as messengers, who were prophets of God, but they were elevated as the Rasuls or the messengers of God. And through them, he punished people who had deliberately denied the truth and as such they had become kafirs. So we must realize that these verses specifically relate to the law of the Almighty uh, which specifically relates to, the, to his messengers. Allah has favored the believers by sending to them a messenger from amongst them, reading and reciting his verses. He did not bring anything from his pocket. Allah says, he did not utter anything from his desires or lusts or fancies. Everything he said was revealed and inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says indeed, in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a perfect example for those who are looking forward to the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who are looking forward to the last day. How many of us are looking forward to meeting with Allah? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah Rabbul Azza created the creation and from the entirety of creation He Azza wa Jal selected, honored, preferred and chose insan. And from amidst the children of Adam, Allah Rabbul Azza exalted, honored, preferred and chose the Anbiya. And in that regards He Azza wa Jal sent 124,000 messengers and prophets to teach, lead and guide mankind. And from the galaxy of Anbiya, Allah Rabbul Izza chose the Rusul, the messengers whom were given a specific revelation or a new Sharia. Ah. And from amidst these chosen category of the Rusul, He Azza wa Jal selected five as the Ulil Azmi min al Rusul, as the greats amidst the messengers. These are the best sons of Adam the princes and the greatest and the grandest amidst the messengers. And then from the select group of five, He Azza wa Jal chose Khalilain Ithnain, two friends, Ibrahim wa Muhammad. And Allah Rabbul Izza selected Ibrahim as a Khalil and Allah Rabbul Izza chose Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a friend. And then he Azza wa Jal from these two friends 
elevated, honored, chosen, preferred our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam for the seal of prophethood. And he honored him with the maqam of Mahmud and Allah Rabbul Izza completed the age-old religion of Islam through him. How can words of a mere individual ever be able to accurately convey the characteristics of Allah's best creation, the like of which humankind have never seen nor will ever see again, the awesomeness of this individual. The greatest human being to ever walk the face of this planet, the role model for the entire world, the most beloved to the heart of any believer, our prophet, our messenger, our example, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. His name means the praiseworthy one. His name means the exalted one. Muhammad, the meaning of the word Muhammad is the one who is praised the most and the one who is praised the highest in all of human history. And no human being has been loved and admired. And no human being will be more respected and venerated on Judgment Day than our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That on Judgment Day, when Allah combines the awwaleen and the akhireen, when Allah combines the Muslims and the non-Muslims, when Allah combines all of humanity, and all of them are worried and scared, and they are expecting Judgment Day to begin, they will say, who amongst us will go and beg Allah to begin the Judgment Day so we can end all of this misery that we are in. So they will look and look and they will say, who better than our father Adam alayhi salam. So they will collectively go to Adam alayhi salam. And the hadith is very long. Adam will say, I'm not worthy of it. Go to somebody else, go to Nuh. Then Nuh will say the same to Ibrahim. Ibrahim will pass it to Musa. Musa will pass it to Isa. Isa will pass it to our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so all of mankind, the first of them, the last of them, the men of them, the jinn of them, the ins of them, the Muslim of them, the kafir of them, all of mankind without exception will unanimously appoint our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he will go and intercede and that will be the time when everybody will praise him. And in this world, it is only the believers who praise him. And on Judgment Day, everyone will praise him. So indeed, he is Muhammad Sallallahu meaning the one who has been praised the utmost. In fact, Allah Himself commands us to send salat upon our Prophet and He reminds us that He Himself has done so. And He has told us that the angels have done so. In that famous verse, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي Say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim. Innaka hamidun majid. When all of the humanity appointed him as the representative on Judgment Day, at that point in time, he will be given the praiseworthy station, which is called Al-Maqam Al-Mahmud. And because it is the praiseworthy station, who better than it be given to than the one who is Muhammad and Ahmad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Both these names, Muhammad and Ahmad, come from the root Hamida and Hamd means to praise. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has praised him, angels have praised him and all of the prophets have praised him and every single one of mankind praises him directly or indirectly. So he is praised in the heavens and in the earth, in the previous nations and in the present nation, in this dunya and in the akhirah. This is the ultimate praise. There is no human being before, now or after who is praised more than the Prophet ﷺ. Rasulullah ﷺ says, I have a number of names. I am Muhammad and I am Ahmad. The name Muhammad is mentioned four times in the Quran. And the only time the name Ahmad is mentioned is from the tongue of Isa a.s. From the tongue of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Isa a.s. says, There will be a messenger after me whose name will be Ahmad. And Prophet says, I am Al-Mahi, the one whom Allah erases kufr through. Through me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will wipe out kufr. And I am Al-Hashir, people will be resurrected after me. And I am Al-Aqib, the one who has no prophet after. 
He is the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I am Nabi al-Rahma, the Prophet of Mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself called our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Rahmatul Ilalameen. Indeed, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mercy. His sending is mercy. His message is mercy. His teachings are mercy. And believing and acting upon what he has come with is a mercy. And he says, I am Nabi al-Tawba, the Prophet of Tawba, the Prophet of Repentance. Meaning by believing in him and following his teachings, people can be forgiven. And I am al-Mukaffa, the one who comes at the end and makes the message of previous prophets complete. And I am Nabi al-Malahim, the Prophet that will signal loads of trials. And indeed the biggest trials the world will ever see will occur in this Ummah. There are many other names and titles for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah that we can learn through the seerah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Describe him to me. Look at the description of your Rasul. I saw a man of striking appearance, radiant face, beautifully created, proportionate and delicate, finely made, a specimen of a creation. The Prophet ﷺ had an awe-inspiring appearance. His face was more radiant, more beautiful than the full moon on the darkest night. If the Prophet ﷺ had nothing but his presence, if he didn't recite anything, if he didn't say anything, you would look at him and you would already know that there was something divinely beautiful about him. With the Prophet ﷺ, everything was perfectly set. He wasn't too tall, nor was he too short. His skin was not too light, nor was it too dark. He had a bright skin color, but at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ was not pasty white. His face was not too round, nor was it too narrow, but it was closer to being round ﷺ. Now, if you're looking at the Prophet ﷺ, and I want you to imagine standing in front of him ﷺ, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to connect with his eyes ﷺ. Prophet ﷺ's eyes had a perfect contrast. The black was exceedingly black in his eyes and the white was exceedingly white. His eyelashes والسلام, were so long that it looked like they naturally had kuhul, they naturally had an eyeliner on them. And they were always moist from his tears وسلم, He had these large curved eyebrows and they were full and they almost connected but there was a beautiful space right between them where the light would shine. The Prophet ﷺ is described as having a prominent forehead. And in his forehead, there was a vein that would only show when he became upset ﷺ. As for his nose, his nose ﷺ was not flat, nor was it too pointy. But the Prophet ﷺ had a finely sloped nose. And they described it as having a unique glimmer to it. So it shines in a way that when you were away from him sallallahu alaihi wasallam you might have assumed that it was larger than it actually was but when you came close to him you realized that it was just the shine of his nose that made it so prominent when he opened his mouth sallallahu alaihi wasallam you would notice his teeth and they were perfectly set remember he used to use the siwak at least 5 times a day so his teeth alayhi salatu wasallam were described as white as hailstones and they weren't clustered together. They were set in a way that there was a fine line between each of those teeth. And his mouth alayhi salatu wasalam was wide and he's described as having a perfect articulation and his voice was melodious. And his hair just like everything else is perfectly in the middle. It wasn't too straight nor was it too curly, but instead it was wavy hair. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam would keep it sometimes to his earlobes Sometimes he would let it go all the way to his shoulder sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And of course, in times of Hajj and Umrah, he would shave his head sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He also had a dense full beard alayhi salatu wasallam. And the Prophet sallallahu used to comb his hair and he used to comb his beard. And they were fully black. And the Sahaba counted just between 14 and 20 gray hairs in his hair and his beard sallallahu alayhi wasallam at the time of his death. So he's 63 and he only had a few gray hairs sallallahu alayhi wasallam in his hair and his beard. And they said when he would use oil sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you couldn't even see them. And when you could see them, they were concentrated right under his lips sallallahu alayhi wasallam and on his sideburns alayhi salatu wasallam. Then you come down to his neck and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi had an elegant long neck. They said it was like the neck of a gazelle sallallahu alayhi wasallam. 
And then you looked at his shoulders. He had broad shoulders Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was strong, strong arms Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. He had a strong chest. And even until the date of his death, his stomach never extended beyond his chest Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he maintained his weight Alayhi Salatu Wasallam and he maintained his fitness. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not a hairy man. So other than his hair on his head and his beard, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not have much hair on the rest of his body. And he had a little bit of hair on his chest and a line that naturally ran down all the way to his navel Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then you come to his limbs. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is described as having well-defined big limbs. So he had big bones, big hands, big feet. He had large calves Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they said that his calves were perfectly round and then he had absolutely no weight on his heels Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. And his lower body was so strong Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he used to be able to jump on a horse and a camel and mount it with absolutely no saddle because of the strength of his lower body. Despite that, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that his hands and his feet were smoother than silk and water would slither right off of the hands and the feet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he had a beautiful scent Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. He would sweat perfume Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When you smelled his sweat, it smelled good. And if you shook the hand of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you would maintain the scent of his hand on your hand for days after meeting him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had the best of breath Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Al-Bara radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Wallahi, I went out one night and I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this red garment. And it was a red hulla from Yemen, his favorite garment to wear on occasions. And he said, I have never seen a sight more beautiful than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on that night. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, when I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was so perfectly set. It was as if he was molded in silver, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the most famous thing about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was his smile. He always was smiling Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. SubhanAllah, in sadness and happiness, he always had a smile on his face Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that idha surra, when he was happy, then his face would become even more radiant Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There was no man that smiled at his ummah more than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But at the same time, there was no man that wept for his ummah than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So during the day, in order to bring joy to the people, he smiled Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at them and that was from his generosity. And during the night, there was no man that would cry more than him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in front of his Lord, also to bring joy and happiness and relief to his blessed ummah. When he walked, he would walk briskly as if he's descending down a slope. Some scholars have also said, that it is as if Allah made the earth humble to him. That wherever he's walking, it's as if the earth is, is, is giving him the place to walk. And others said this is metaphorical. What it means is that, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ would walk briskly and he's walking so fast that most of us, we can only walk like that when we're going down an inclined plane. When he turned, he would turn to face with his whole body. So he's walking, somebody calls him, he turns to face him with his whole body. Between his two shoulders was the seal of the prophethood. The Prophet ﷺ had a physical seal, a physical something. And this sign is the seal of the prophets. It is basically a outgrowth of hair in an area where hair does not grow and it is of a different color. And it was between his shoulder blades, shaped like a pigeon's egg, an oval, small oval, like a pigeon's egg. And in his voice was a natural echo. When he was silent, dignity covered him. And when he spoke, it was audible and clear almost commanding and overtaking from afar the most striking and outstanding in appearance when he commanded they used to compete to fulfill the command like when he used to speak it was so coherently logical it was smooth and easy to understand he was to the point not excessive nor too short his logic his utterances his words were like beads like 
jewels coming out of a necklace, calculated, polished, one after the other, it would flow magically. The people that were with him, they were working around him to try to serve and protect him. When he used to say something, they used to hearken to what he used to say. This is Muhammad Rasulullah. This is Muhammad Rasulullah. Anas ibn Malik says, I came out one night, it was the full moon night. I looked at the moon and in the desert understand the moon is, is an awesome sight. It is smooth, it is radiant, it is clear, it is gentle compared to the scorching sun at which they are used to. So the moon was the epitome of beauty. So he says, I came out at a full moon night and I looked at the, at the moon and I saw it beautiful, handsome. So I said, let me go see if the moon is more handsome or my prophet is more handsome. Let me see if that is more beautiful or the prophet is more beautiful. So I went and I saw him standing afar. So I looked at his face and I looked at the moon and I looked at his face and I looked at the moon and I looked at his face and I looked at the moon and he said, Wallahi, he was more handsome than the moon in its entirety. That is just the look of your Rasul. Aisha radiallahu anha says, I was sewing with the needle. My needle dropped in the dark. I couldn't find it. I said, Ya Rasul, I can't find it. He moved his face close and I swear, out of the radiance of his face, I found my needle. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was mind bogglingly handsome. But his handsomeness was covered with waqar in Jalal in Haybah. The Sahaba say, when we used to sit at his feet, two feelings conflicting would come on the heart. The first one, you wanted to look at him. You wanted to behold the majesty of his face. And when you wanted to look up, shyness used to overtake you, so you used to look down. At the same instance, two conflict. Amr ibn al-As says, I sat with him many times, but if you ask me to describe his face, I can't describe it. I couldn't look up at him because it was difficult to penetrate the awe and the splendor of the Rasul. More beautiful than you, my eyes have never seen. More beautiful than you, the women have never given birth to. You have been created free from all flaws, physical flaws. As though you have been created how you wanted to be created. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the best of creation in such a way that just by looking at him, you'd love him. Subhanallah. Abdullah ibn Salam radiallahu anhu, he was a Jewish rabbi. When he saw Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the first time, he said, as soon as I saw this face, I knew this is not the face of a liar. This man utters the truth. He is the Nabi. And immediately that same majlis, the same sitting, he had accepted Islam because he heard the words of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, those are the words of a messenger. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us truthful. As for his specialities, something that only he was given and no other human being was given. Number one, he is the final Prophet of Allah. And there's only one Prophet that can be the final. And Allah chose him to be the final Prophet. Number two, the Prophethood of our Prophet Wasallam had been decreed by Allah even before Adam salam existed. Even before the Ruh was blown into Adam. Of the specialities of our Prophet Wasallam, number three, is that he is the only Prophet to have been sent for all of humanity. In fact, the only prophet to have been sent even to the jinn. No prophet before our Prophet was sent to all of humanity. No prophet. Every single prophet was sent to a specific nation. Of the specialities of our Prophet Wasallam, our Prophet Wasallam said that Allah has helped me with ru'ub. Ru'ub means a type of fear that Allah will inflict into my enemies even before I reach them, that when he went into battle against an enemy, 
then the people began became terrified of him even before he reached them. Of the specialities that he has been given was that he has been given the largest ummah out of all of the prophets. Of his specialities that no other prophet has been given is that he has been given the most powerful miracle. And that is the miracle of the Qur'an. There is no miracle that compares to the Qur'an. Look at any other miracle that you can imagine. The splitting of the Red Sea. All of these miracles, we have no access to them. We didn't see the splitting of the Red Sea. It's not really a miracle for me and you, except that we believe in it. But the Qur'an is a miracle I can recite and the people can hear. It's a living miracle. Of the specialities that our Prophet has been given, is the night journey of al Isra wal Mi'raj. No other Prophet has had the privilege of undertaking this journey. The only human being to have been called up to the presence of Allah Azza wa Jal. Of his specialities that he was given is that he is the leader of all of humanity and he deserves to be the leader of humanity. And he will be the leader of humanity on the Day of Judgment. Of the blessings that are unique to him is that the Prophet وسلم, will be the very first human being to be resurrected on the Day of Judgment as we said. The first grave to open up when the second trumpet is blown. The Prophet وسلم, said the first grave that will crack open will be mine. Of the specialities that he has been given is that he will be given the largest hawd. And hawd is a pool that our Prophet has been promised of his speciality is the Kawthar. He has been given the main river of Jannah and all the rivers of Jannah split from that. It is as if the people of Jannah will drink water from the gift of the Prophet Of his specialities is he will be the first to cross over the Sirat and he will be the one guiding his Ummah to Jannah and he will be the first to knock on the doors of Jannah and he will be the first human being to ever enter Jannah after our father Adam has left it and he will be the one in whose name the gates of Jannah will be opened and then his Ummah will be the first Ummah even though we are the last Ummah chronologically but because we are his Ummah and because we are his followers Allah will bless us and Allah will gift us and Allah will honor us not because of us but because of him and we will be asked to enter along with him so we will be the first Ummah to enter Jannah even though we are the last Ummah chronologically the final speciality that will be mentioned is that Allah has blessed him with the highest level of Jannah. It is a level that is the pinnacle of Al-Firdaus Al-A'la. It is an entire level. Some scholars have said that Jannah, you can look at it kind of like a pyramid in that the higher up you go, the fewer the people. So Jannah will be more populated at the lower levels. And the higher up you go, fewer and fewer people will be able to get to those levels. And there will come a point and there will come a level that is an entire level of Jannah. And that is meant for only one person. The whole plane of that field of Jannah is only meant for one person. And it is the pinnacle of Al-Firdaus Al-A'la and it is immediately underneath the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is called Al-Fadila and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that this Fadila it is a level of Jannah that Allah has chosen for only one of his servants and then he said modestly that I hope that that I am that person in Mecca where he was born he was known as Al-Amin, the most trustworthy. Even though his enemies had stole from his followers, killed his followers, tortured his followers, confiscated their properties, he could have done what others do in warfare. He could have then confiscated their wealth that he was holding. But when they entered his home to kill him, they did not find him there. Instead, they found his cousin Ali radiallahu an. And he left Ali in his house when he escaped for only one reason. So that Ali radiallahu an could give back to them the valuables, the money 
that they had entrusted with him years ago. Can you imagine a man who is hated for his message, opposed for his message, sought to be killed, yet those people who hated the message and sought to kill him, they never thought to come and say, give us back our money. Because still they trusted him. Because they knew there was no one with more trust in Mecca than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many of us are truthful and trustworthy? How many of the youth out here are trustworthy and truthful? That was young age, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But at the same time, how many of us would be able to follow that example and say, yes, I am also a truthful person, upright, and I am honest. Take a look at Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha. When she had sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon his agreement to Asham in order to trade, when he came back, she praised him so much. This is the most honest businessman ever. Subhanallah. When Quraysh had a problem prior to prophethood, they called on this man sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to help them arrive at a conclusion. This is something unique. How many of us would ever be called upon in order to conclude something or are we a part of the problem? That will determine how far or close you are to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam's example. How much you really consider him a role model. A role model is a person you look up to and follow. You want to be like. He is the only role model that is supremely in every single aspect of life. Amazing. So where is your truthfulness? Here is a woman who wanted to marry him. And subhanallah, based on the fact that his character was absolutely amazing. His conduct, the accountability, the fact that every little portion of wealth was recorded and every little portion was accounted for. Subhanallah. That was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many of us in business, we are not transparent. We have a problem with our partners, with those we actually sell things to. And with those we buy from, we haven't even cleared the accounts. Where are you? Where is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Apply it in your lives. No point in saying, oh, I consider him a role model, but you are cheating people in business. You are shortchanging people. Prior to prophethood, you've already learned. You want to follow this man, subhanallah. He has had a record that is spotless, speckless, absolutely amazing, totally perfect. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let's move further. The example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he came down from the cave of Hira with prophethood, the first person he confided in was his wife. How many of us, when we have a big problem, we would confide in our own spouses? A lot of us would not do that. A lot of us would hide our issues from our spouses, either because we have a problem or they have a problem, or both of us have a problem. But if you're close to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and your aim is to please Allah, you will never ever have to hide things from your spouses. That was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When his wife comforted him, she gave him a big tight hug. And this goes to show subhanallah, that a tight hug really helps. A big enveloping hug would actually help. It is a sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He came down saying, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, cover me, cover me. And you know, the, the two surahs, Muzammil, Muddathir, referring to the enveloped one, the one who was hugged, subhanallah. Even in the romantic aspect of life with your own spouse, he was a champion, subhanallah. Take a look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Here, his wife tells him, Nay, indeed, Allah will never ever let you down. Why? Because you are a person who looks after your family members. That's an example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These family members, the kuffar of Quraysh, they were family members of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from among them. And what did he do? He always was kind towards them, but he gave them the message. He was always good. He never swore. He never did he use a bad word from his mouth. Never. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today we are quick in calling people kafir, in calling people bad names in calling people and we claim to be followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where did he do that? In his midst lived hypocrites. Still, he treated them with kindness. When you have a person uttering dirty words, tell yourself, Wallahi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not only never uttered a bad word, but he said, a true believer is never vulgar, never disrespectful, never abusive. He doesn't utter words that are hurtful from his mouth against someone. If we look further into the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we will find that Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha, she says, Allah will never let you down. You go out to mend the relationships that may be broken. 
you make an effort to go and to fix up relations. So when someone is not talking to you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would go and he would try make an effort to resolve the matter as best as he can without compromising what Allah has brought. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many of you can say that when there has been a problem, I have tried my best to resolve the matter. I have tried my best. I've gone. You may not be able to solve it, but did you try? And how hard did you try? And are you prepared to go and try again and again? That is following Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Similarly, the narration speaks, the same narration speaks of how Khadija bint Khawarid radiallahu anha was bearing witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to help those in need. Today, people in need, do we really help them? And if we help them, do we brag about it? Do we make a show about it? Or do we help them for the sake of Allah? In a way taught by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, when a charity is given, even the left hand does not know what the right hand has spent, then that is the charity. How many of us do that? We reach out or are we selfish? We want everything for ourselves. Even in our own homes, the opinions are only ours. We pick on everybody else. When are you going to give someone else in your house an opinion? someone else within your home a statement every day it's your way today let it be someone else's way subhanallah it doesn't mean you're the husband you're the father so you're the boss of the home in a way that you can boss people around no way that's not islam muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the role model used to help in the house he used to milk the goat he used to assist in cleaning the home how many of you do that i think a lot of us a lot of us would be guilty of not doing enough in that regard how many of you would help in the kitchen? How many of you would help washing the clothes? How many of you would help sweep and clean up? How many of you would help when it comes to ironing your clothes? How many of you would help when it comes to going out and perhaps getting some milk or something else? Today we might not be milking the goat and in some places you may be, but you might not be milking it, but even to go out to the store to buy it and to bring it back home, that is a good deed. In fact, it would be following the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu to assist in bringing the milk along. Allahu Akbar. He was concerned about the welfare of others. He used to help people at times of need. Let us take a look later on in the life of Muhammad sallallahu He was so concerned about the guidance of the rest of the people. So he calls the people of Quraysh and he called them to Mount Safa and he asked them a question. He says, oh, you people of Quraysh, my family members, kinsmen and so on. If I were to tell you that there is an army behind this mountain ready to attack you, would you believe? They said, indeed, we would believe you've never told a lie. You are an honest, you are known amongst us as as sadiq al amin As we said earlier, the truthful one, the honest one, the trustworthy one. Why would we disbelieve? So he said, I am warning you about a punishment that is about to come to you unless you believe in one Allah, the maker alone. Immediately they uttered bad words. Abu Lahab says, Tabbal laka ya Muhammad. Destruction be to you, O Muhammad. Ali hadha jama'atana. Is this why you gathered us? And verses were revealed later on, mentioning the destruction of Abu Lahab. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, how did he react to that? Did he swear back? No, he didn't. From even thinking of that, he did not utter a single bad word. He was quiet. He took it. Today, for us, how would we take someone who criticizes us? Would we get up and say the same vulgar words as they say? Or would we be sensible about the whole thing? Yes, you have every right to react, but your reaction must be noble. From your reaction, people must be able to pick up that this is prophetic. It is noble. It is the teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It is sensible. It is something that a sane, mature human being who's a mu'min, who has belief, who wants to emulate the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam would do. They started spreading rumor saying he's a magician. He's after power. He's after wealth. He's after this and he's after that. He wants to be the leader. That's all. He is seeking attention. Never ever did he accuse them of the same. Not once. He remained silent. He knows that I am working for Allah. Allah is my boss. Supreme. Allah is the creator, maker, nourisher, cherisher, sustainer. Allah is Rabbul Alameen. So immediately he knew that the best way to deal with these people is to listen to what they have to say, respond in the best manner as per Allah's instruction and remain silent thereafter. Pray for them. They need your prayers. Today with our enemies, they say something against you or against me. Immediately, a lot of us would just raise our hands and say, Oh Allah, destroy this person. Oh Allah, break them. Oh Allah, finish them up. 
Well, if that was the case, the whole world would be finished up because you are praying for my destruction. I am praying for your destruction. That's not prophetic. How many of us have raised our hands and said, Oh Allah, help him. Oh Allah, guide them. These people don't know. Take a look at Ta'if. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa went to Ta'if, you and I know what happened there. How did he react? That is the role model. That is the ultimate role model. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Oh Allah, guide my people. Because indeed they don't know. When the angels came and offered to destroy the whole lot of them by bringing the two mounts together, he said, No way. I have been sent as a mercy. I have been sent as a mercy to the worlds, not as a means of their destruction. If they don't accept, perhaps their children will accept. Amazing. Look at how Muhammad وسلم, used to think. Take a look at the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. What did he do? He spoke to the Kuffar. He tried to strike with them a treaty and he struck it. Even though they suggested some things that were considered unacceptable by some of the companions. But Muhammad وسلم, said, no problem. If that is going to bring about peace, we will sign it, meaning we will agree upon it. How many of us, we don't even make peace in our own homes, within our own communities, within the Muslim Ummah. We don't want to make peace. We want to create war within the Ummah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Hudaybiyah was making peace with his enemies, those who came out to fight him, those who drove him away from his own home, those who drove him and his companions away, those who killed some of his companions and who were keen on doing the same to him. And yet he's signing with them a treaty. If there's going to be peace, let there be peace. Allah will guide us. Allah will protect us. When it came to the wars that took place, he made it very clear. You don't harm a female. You don't harm a child. You don't harm an elderly person. You do not break trees. You do not destroy infrastructure. Today, people are doing all of those things in the name of the same Islam. Where are they? Where is the following of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? We believe it is correct and it is absolutely perfect in terms of an example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam up to the end of time right up to the end of time when he said do not fight those who put their weapons down you're not even supposed to fight them as they put their weapons down and they say we don't want to fight those who enter their homes and close the doors the reason I'm making mention of this is there are deviant groups who happen to massacre innocent women children they destroy infrastructure they cause harm they create chaos they cause problems for the Muslim Ummah to begin with and then the others in the name of Islam in your name and mine. This is not the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the role model of compassion. Like he says, I was sent as a mercy. If he was sent as a mercy, we need to be merciful as well. We need to understand Islam will spread. When we spread this love and this mercy and the peace and we educate people as to how we are meant to be coexisting. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam struck a deal with the people in Medina Munawwara who were not even Muslim. They were people of the book and some of them were idol worshippers. Peaceful coexistence in a nutshell. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand this beautiful example of the most noble of all prophets, the highest of all creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you hear his name and you do not utter the term sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or you do not say peace be upon him, you have disrespected him. Did you know that? There is a curse upon a person who just utters that name disrespectfully on its own. People have tried to tarnish the image of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No way, they will not manage. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Indeed, we have protected you against those who want to scoff, who want to mock, who want to joke about you. This would include anyone up to the end of time. We have protected your reputation. We have protected who you are. They can say whatever they want. Wallahi, the more they say, the more the people are entering the fold of Islam. The more others are beginning to love the faith. They can do what they want to extinguish that powerful example. They will never be able to do that. May Allah help us promote love, promote mercy, promote kindness. May Allah help us to solve our matters between us so that we can live as an ummah. Let's take a look at Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. Wallahi, I served the messenger, may peace be upon him, for 10 whole years. Imagine 10 years. I served Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what does he say? فَمَا قَالَ لِيَ أُفٍ قَطُّ وَمَا قَالَ لِشَيْءٍ صَنَعْتُهُ لِمَا صَنَعْتَهُ He has never ever told me a single hurtful word 
and I was working for him. Not one oof. He didn't even make a gesture or a noise, a sound that was derogatory or negative. Never did he say oof to me. This is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Never did he say for anything that I did, why did you do this? If I did something wrong, he would correct it himself with a smile. How many of us, those who work for us, we are so bad to them, we are rude to them, we treat them like they are not human beings, we abuse them in whatever way. We don't pay them, we should change them, we treat them like they are animals, and we claim to be Muslimin. A man with a huge vision. The Prophet wasallam, the best of Allah's creation, was physically abused. Dirt was poured on his blessed back, and he is in sajda, and he didn't lift his himself up from the sajda. He stayed. Someone went and told Fatima al Zahra, they have just poured dirt on the back of your father. She came crying, young girl at that stage, and she's cleaning the dirt and cursing them. And the Prophet wasallam says, Don't worry, ya Fatima. Don't worry, my little daughter. What your father has brought will go to every house on the planet. Do you see the vision? At what time? Where he can't protect himself. The Prophet ﷺ was brave. Brave in following his vision. And brave in nature. The Rasul was brave. But whilst he was brave, he wasn't arrogant. Bravery means to overcome your fears.